the Stabruk News Baited Suku and the run away with the old hook and everything. And as a result, Suku had to respond. But let me make it clear. Let me put things in proper context here, man. There were two investigations. There were two investigations. Investigation number one. Brutus deposited scores of sugar cane workers at Blairmont Sugar Estate in Burbis down their tools today over a number of issues, including the need for additional pay. The strike action by the workers started early this morning, with scores of them refusing to turn on to duty and gathering outside the estate gates in large numbers. The Guyana Sugar Corporation and the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union scores of sugar cane workers at Blairmont Sugar Estate in Burbis down their tools today over a number of issues, including the need for additional Pay. The strike action by the workers started early this morning, with scores of them refusing to turn on the duty and gathering outside the estate gates in large numbers. As statutory councillor, bet you actually walked with the materials from the night the dark room, and it was tested by the roadside that showed that it had rare earth, minerals, and sediments right here. The concern of the night the dark road is both times. When it's dry season, yes. that dust is getting up. What Betchman showed us is going to get into residence system. We now going to have almost a thousand vehicles by residents who live in constituency four, Kupani, I truly included. You have five institutions in this area, from the hospital, the Kutuka, the school, the church, it's going to compound more. So whether it's raining or sun, and you're using that night the dark road, even to the people in night the dark, this investigation was triggered by this a deposit of $46.4 million at I think at the, the, the Amarara Bank by Brutus. The money was accepted by the bank. The bank, as it is obligated to do under the law, reported to the Financial Intelligence Unit. And CC made the point, I was the first person appointed to head that unit, you know. <laughs> In 2003, when I wanted to get rid of me of the force, with him, um, Gadraj, when I, I, I declined, according to what my lawyer advised me uh, to say, I declined to carry out that unlawful order by Gadraj. Welcome back to the flight. Hit that subscription button, buddy, and stay updated with everything that's trending in Guyana and the diaspora. Thanks. Last week at the second annual Regional Investments and Capital Markets Conference held in Georgetown, Guyana's senior minister with responsibility for finance, Dr. Ashley Singh, touted the country as one of the most attractive places for business investment in the world. The two-day event was hosted by the Jamaica Stock Exchange under the theme Financing for Success, where passion, prosperity, and people align. Addressing investors and business leaders on October 9th at the Pegasus Hotel, Dr. Singh acknowledged the transformative impact of oil discovery in the country. However, he was quick to underline that Guyana's progress began long before oil started being produced. He emphasized that Guyana's economic growth is no sudden phenomenon but the result of decades of strategic efforts, particularly under the People's Progressive Party, civic governments. This isn't a flash in the pan. This isn't a bolt of lightning that has come from the sky. Decades of work have gone into getting Guyana to where we are. Of course, the discovery of oil has helped, and I would not insult your intelligence to suggest otherwise, Dr. Singh said. Of course, it has helped, but what it has helped us to do is to do more, to do it better and to do it more quickly, he added. The minister told the investors that the government's focus has always been on building a competitive and diversified economy, which has made Guyana an appealing destination for business long before oil was found. Scores of sugarcane workers at Blairmont Sugar Estate in Burbis down their tools today over a number of issues, including the need for additional pay. The strike action by the workers started early this morning, with scores of them refusing to turn onto duty and gathering outside the estate gates in large numbers. The Guyana Sugar Corporation and the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union are both tight-lipped on the strike action, offering no statements. Meanwhile, opposition spokesman on agriculture and member of parliament for Region 5, Vinceroy Jordan has been following the issue closely, and he explained to news source this afternoon that the workers, who are attached to the harvesting unit, are 
tasked with detrashing the sugarcane in preparation for production. However, they are not paid additional money for the additional job, and that has caused an issue. They would have downed tools, basically refusing to have to detrash canes and be forced to do excess work based on the orders of the supervisors without being paid for the additional work to get the cane to the standard and quality that the factory would require of it. M.P. Jordan explained. The trashing refers to the removal of unwanted leaves and other materials from the cane. MP Jordan said the workers have been in contact with their union representatives within the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union and have expressed their position. They have said very clearly that they are not prepared to work under those conditions, he said. According to the MP, it is now up to the union representatives and their members to determine if the protests will continue for another day, as talks have started with Guy's UCO on the issue. Scores of sugar cane workers at Blairmont Sugar Estate and Burbis down their tools today over a number of issues, including the need for additional paint. The strike action by the workers started early this morning, with scores of them refusing to turn on to duty and gathering outside the estate gates in large numbers. The Guyana Sugar Corporation and the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union are both tightly done the strike action, offering no statement. Meanwhile, opposition spokesman on agriculture and member of parliament for Region 5. Vince Roy Jordan has been following the issue closely, and he explained to news source this afternoon that the workers, who are attached to the harvesting unit, are tasked with detrashing the sugar cane in preparation for production. However, they are not paid additional money for the additional job, and that has caused an issue. They would have down to basically refusing to have to detrash canes and be forced to do excess work based on the orders of the supervisors without being paid for the additional work to get the cane to the standard and quality that the factory would require of it. MP Jordan explained, the trashing refers to the removal of unwanted leaves and other materials from the cane. MP Jordan said the workers have been in contact with their union representatives within the Guyana Agriculture and General Workers Union and have expressed their position. They have said very clearly that they are not prepared to work under those conditions, he said. According to the MP, it is now up to the union representatives and their members to determine if the protests will continue for another day, as talks have started with Guy's UCO on the issue. Scores of sugar cane workers at Blairmont Sugar Estate and Burbis down their tools today over a number of issues, including the need for additional paint. The strike action by the workers started early this morning, with scores of them refusing to turn onto duty and gathering outside the estate gates in large numbers. The Guyana Sugar Corporation and the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union are both tightly on the strike action, offering no statements. Meanwhile, opposition spokesman on agriculture and member of parliament for Region 5, Vince Roy Jordan has been following the issue closely, and he explained to news source this afternoon that the workers, who are attached to the harvesting unit, are tasked with detraching the sugar cane in preparation for production. However, they are not paid additional money for the additional job, and that has caused an issue. They would have down to basically refusing to have to the trash canes and be forced to do excess work based on the orders of the supervisors without being paid for the additional work to get the cane to the standard and quality that the factory would require of it. MP Jordan explained, the trashing refers to the removal of unwanted leaves and other materials from the cane. MP Jordan said the workers have been in contact with their union representatives within the Guyana Agricultural and General Workers Union. The Ministry of Public Works has denied the claim by the Linden mayor and town council and published by this newspaper yesterday that the access road at New Ejedek poses a toxic threat to residents of the area, though it has not yet conducted independent testing of samples. In a statement released yesterday via its official Facebook page, the ministry wrote, the claims made in this article are misleading, the information referenced is inaccurate, and there is no evidence of a toxic threat to the residents of Linden resulting from the materials used on the road. The statement skirted the fact that the materials used on the road were tailings from a disused aluminium plant. The ministry stated that the report cited by Mayor Sharma Salome, which pointed to unsafe levels of heavy metals such as arsenic, zinc, nickel, and chromium, was based on an unsigned document that did not correspond to actual samples taken from the road. It added that during a stakeholders' meeting held on October 12, 2024, at the Wadaka Guest House, Minister of Public Works Juan Edgar was presented with these concerns and he committed to addressing them with the necessary urgency. As statutory council of Metro, actually worked with the materials from the night in that room and it was tested by the website that showed that it had rare earth minerals and sediments right here. The concern of a night that road is both times. When it's dry season, that dust is getting up, 
what bedroom showed us is when we get into residence system. We now will have almost a thousand vehicles by residents who live in constituency four, Kupani, I truly included. You have five institutions in this area, from the hospital, the local, the school, the church, it's going to compound more. So whether it's raining or sun, and you're using that Nikadak road, even for the people in Nikadak or those commuters, it's going to be dangerous. As railroad elements are found in the sediment used to cap that road at moon. So even if you want to use that, that's one day. So you, you're suggesting that the materials you use You have changed. to do something to cap that road. If not with bitumen, chip seal, something. Not only because of dry season, the rare earth elements, but you're looking a month and a half from now, the rainy season. So outside of the 500 plus, and now thousands that's going to be using exclusively there, is going to be a problem. And that is what we have said to the bridge people. And I'm glad we had this meeting because they were very facilitating. But every time we spoke to them, they would say we have to come back to you. And seven months ago, we'd asked the engagement. We were told a side conversation happened. And that is what we had gotten in terms of what the industry is. All right? Thank you, sir. Some so stuff. what we can do, very special. We got a lot of these help. So just give me. Just before, sorry. So that's just one of our concerns that raised the young tree. Yeah, that you if you could give us the, um, if you could give us the material and your lab results, let us check. We don't want to put anybody's uh, health at danger. You know that we put strong measures on the bauxite company to stop them from, um, until they could have gotten the dust trap at their him. To ensure the likelihood of people, so I don't see why we would be any different on this. Okay. So, uh, so if the materials use is causing a problem, um, we really can have a look at that. Yes, yeah, the material is problematic because this is not a regular thing that we use. This, this back road, um, I think, it was done twice in the past three or four years, a recent of two months ago. The material that they keep using is the material from the aluminum plant. Um, which is the unsaturated steel that we're As the native version said, um, that material, we were told that it has the raw material thorium because um, it has 70 GPMs that came here in the study and they identified that it has some percentage of thorium. Recently, about two months ago, I took it on my own to sample the material. I only received those results about a week ago and that was part of the discussion. I did share it with Dr. Harris and uh, some of the other persons, uh, key persons for us to have a meeting with them and to address it. But if we're going on that back road um, and increase the level volume of traffic, of course it goes the dry days and decrease the concentration of uh, fugitive dust. So it's something that needs to be addressed right to I had also I do um, some cap in some key areas about two or three days ago, and that entire road should be kept or um, as important as possible. It is based on the results that I have, um, we need to discuss. Is that it? Yeah, sure, just one time. Let me just be clear. No, sir. This is the first time I'm hearing about it. actually my point. Seven yeah. months Right? Ago. So this is the first time I'm hearing about it. Um, so nobody can say I know about it. I was insensitive and didn't respond. I've listened to the a Crane, West Coast Demerara resident, is living in constant fear for her health since the appearance of a mysterious oily substance in her living room on October 3rd. The 67-year-old woman, Basmati Singh, resides with her son. The woman told this newspaper that she discovered drops of an oily substance in the bottom flat of her two-story home, a short distance from the seafront, while cleaning. Singh, who has been living in the area for the past 17 years, said she had never encountered the substance before. The first time I see this thing is when I was cleaning. I cleaned outside the house then I came inside and start clean and I noticed this thing on the tiles. So I call my son and show him. We remove the mat and we observe oil at other spots and then we move the furniture and start to see one and two different spots and then he decided to call some persons and they came, she explained. Both Basmati and her son said they touched a substance which had an oil consistency. The Environmental Protection Agency was alerted of the situation on October 7th. 
a team from the EPA, the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission and ExxonMobil Guyana Limited visited Singh's home on October 8. The team conducted tests and took samples of the substance for further testing off-site. The family was later informed by the EPA during his second visit to their home on October 11 that the living room area was high in sulfur dioxide. Police had damning revelations surrounding the murder of political activist Courtney Crum Ewing and the alleged killing by the police of Camp Street Prison Escapee. Yuri Varswick had shone a spotlight on the sordid links between the police, politicians, and the criminal underworld in Guyana. The police claimed that ex-policeman Yuri Varswick and others broke out of the Camp Street prison on July 9, after inmates had set fire to the prison to distract the authorities. However, a source with highly sensitive information about the operations of the police in 2017 claims that the police along with several named politicians were the masterminds behind all of the prison disturbances and the planned escape of Yuri Varswick. In fact, according to the source, Varswick was allegedly approached with an offer to kill Crummy Wing, but when he refused his troubles with the Guyana police force began. The orders to take out Crum, E. Wing came from a politician. Varswick, an ex-policeman was then charged for the December 2014 murder of Sterling Products Limited security guard, Wilfred Stewart and the execution-style killing of GGMC engineer, Trevor Abrams in 2015. Varswick had been documenting all the illegal orders, telephone conversations and other evidence against his superiors. On March 10, 2015, 40-year-old Crum Ewing, a father of three, was gunned down in Diamond Housing Scheme on the East Bank Demerara while urging residents to vote at the May 11 elections. The 40-year-old man had staged a one-man protest outside of the office of Attorney General Anna Nanlo calling for him to resign. Or on these revelations to come, the Special Organized Crime Unit of the Guyana Police Force has announced that it has recommended dozens of charges against Assistant Commissioner of Police, Calvin Brutus, and is now awaiting the advice of the Director of Public Prosecutions. In a statement this morning, SOCU explained that while no criminal charges were recommended against Mr. Brutus following the completion of initial investigations into certain activities that he was allegedly involved in, a more expansive investigation was undertaken after the unit received critical information from the Financial Intelligence Unit. The Financial Intelligence Unit was established under the Anti-Money Laundering Act as an agency responsible for requesting, receiving, analyzing and dissemination of suspicious transaction reports and other information relating to money laundering, terrorist financing or proceeds of crime. The statement from SOCU indicated that the expanded investigation, which was based on information received from the FIU, was completed on the, the 1st of October 2024 and all of the relevant files were sent to the Director of Public Prosecutions for review, advice, and further action. SOCU said, in respect of the expansive investigation, it has recommended dozens of charges and is now awaiting the legal advice of the Director of Public Prosecutions. A special organized crime unit described as misleading a front-page report in today's Stabroke News that its probe of the assistant police commissioner has found no evidence of a crime. Mr. Brutus proceeded on leave earlier this year amid claims of financial improprieties linked to the Guyana Police Forces Credit Union. The news understands that while that investigation involving the credit union may not have found any wrongdoing on Mr. Brutus' behalf, it triggered the much wider investigation after millions of dollars were noticed in his bank accounts and the accounts of at least two relatives. Stabrook News baited Suku and they ran away with the old hook and everything. And as a result, Suku had to respond. But let me make it clear. Let me put things in proper context here, man. There were two investigations. There were two investigations. Investigation number one, Brutus deposited over, I think, $46 million at a bank. He produced what he called, he said, documents to show that this, this money was legally obtained. I mean, we're going to deal with that later on. The teller accepted the money. But the bank, in its wisdom, had the, the, the suspicion that, that, that this thing was part of money laundering, the deposit. That it was part of money laundering, suspicious, a suspicious transaction. As a result, they 
report to the financial FIU, Financial Investigative Unit. Probably should have been a member of that uh, some, some, some years ago. The Financial Investigation Unit, according to the information I, I got, contacted Suku and asked for an investigation. Suku started the investigation and contacted the extended squatter, the, the acting commissioner of police. And in an effort, I want to believe, to save his cousin, the number two man in the force, he wrote a long letter, which we will analyze, a long letter to, in an attempt to show that this money here that Brutus deposited was clean money, was clean money. And Suku and the commissioner, they alleged a lot of cover up and they submitted a report indicating that it wasn't any part of money laundering. Surprisingly, the FIU agreed with them and they closed the file and put it in cold storage. Nothing, nothing to implicate him in terms of money laundering, so clean money, close the file, end of the matter. The end of the the, the, the the force investigation. Subsequently, things surface about same financial irregularities at the at the police consumers at the police squad at the master store at the at other at, 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 at locations including the credit union involving hundreds of millions of dollars an investigation in-depth investigation was done the commissioner didn't write any statement so far investigations done and what i gather is that since then many offenses has been disclosed, including money laundering, falsification of accounts, embezzlement, obtaining money through forged documents, fraud, and others. I think the, 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 the count I, I got is that there are over what 30 offenses committed. Over about 30 offenses committed. And they're saying that Brutus and others are culpable. I'm hearing that the file has gone to the DPP. I won't be surprised if the politically controlled DPP would say that there is insufficient evidence to prosecute anyone. And I want to give some free advice to some people that if if if, if that is done, even the DPP saying sufficient, even they must do what we call, we call, we call a, a Henry Green. Remember when Henry Green, when the DPP recommended that Henry Green get charged with rape, before the police could have contacted him, he rushed to the court. He rushed to Ian Chan, who was then the acting Chief Justice. And Ian Chang is to tell DPA, come, come before this court and justify why you advise the police to charge Henry Green. Come and prove to us. Come and justify it. They weren't able to justify it. Henry Green wasn't charged. So this thing could happen now if they said don't charge Brutus and others. Somebody can rush to the court and say, let the DPP say, why she advised if she do so why she advised that henry that um brutus and others should not be charged for any criminal offense so the thinking can cut both ways but i'm saying going back to the point 
there were two investigations. The first one done, and a cook up it. Commissioner read a statement to cover his, his, his cousin and his number two one man, man in the force, and, and to show that hey, the money was clean money, got from other sources, including awards, incentives. And if there were awards, they used to give themselves awards $800,000, a million dollars. We're going to shoot once a year. They used to give themselves a million dollars, $800,000, 800000 and it's going to plenty, plenty money for the top gunners. And they go in the welfare fund, the, 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 the Lalo Driver fund, and all the other funds, and, 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 and I rip them apart. But the, the point is, that the first investigation was conducted and they cover up and they send the file, the file went to the FIU and they decided that, hey, there is no evidence to prove that they, there was money laundering. And surprisingly, that investigative Body agreed with them, closed the file in cold storage. And now, this big one, this second investigation, in investigation disclosed numerous charges, over about 30 offenses alleged to have been committed by Brutus and others, not alone, and others. Understand it has gone to the DPP and it's there for the DPP to decide one way or the other. But as I suggested, if the DPP adopted a certain course of action, certain persons should do likewise. So, two investigations one in cold storage and the other one is active. Now, good, well, good analysis. But let me tell you about the, the first investigation. Let me talk about that. Based on what is being revealed, the first investigation was triggered by this a deposit of $46.4 million at I think at the, the, the Emirata Bank by Brutus. The money was accepted by the bank. The bank, as it is obligated to do under the law, reported to the Financial Intelligence Unit. And CC made the point, I was the first person appointed to that unit, you know. <laughs> In 2003, when I wanted to get rid of me of the force with him, um, Godrad, when I, I, I declined, according to what my lawyer advised me um, to say, I declined to carry out that unlawful order by Godrad, and then I declined to offer an apology at the insistence of President Jack Dew. I was, I got a letter here, I got a letter, I got them cargoes, you know. I was given a letter and unceremoniously moved out of the force to the Financial Intelligence Unit. At that time, the unit was passed, arrangement was made in Parliament, but no arrangement was made to set up the unit. So Jack Du and Lunchan decided to send me to the unit. Well, I went to court because my lawyer advised me that it was an attempt to remove me from my office without cause. And we went to court and we got an injunction and the rest, as they say, is history. Now, the first man to have been appointed to that unit after I refused was Mr. Paul Gear. Paul was appointed and he started the unit and now I think it's Mr. Langevine has been there ever since. But let me tell you what happened. The money was deposited for the $46.4 million in January of this year. One man deposited it, a police officer. So quite rightly, suspicions were raised and it was reported to the Financial Intelligence Unit. They then informed SOKU because as far as I'm aware, the Financial Intelligence Unit they don't conduct investigations of this nature. They report to the investigative branch, which is a, with SOKU, because you talk about money laundering, the suspicion of money laundering. So SOKU started the information, the investigation. And here it is. SOKU, according to the statement from Ikin, dated May the 20th, 2024, right? And I'm going to read the statement. He was contacted and he gave a statement. It says the, the, the police headquarters is up on official police um, letterhead, May the 20th, 2024, Clifton Akin, Commissioner of Police State. He wasn't acting then. He was Commissioner. 
So he said, Clifton Aiken, Commissioner of Police states. Then he says, I am the Commissioner of Police and my office is situated at the above mentioned address. On, on September, this is what he's saying, no, I'll tell you, you're going to lies. On September 2023, I received an, unofi an official wedding invitation from Calvin Brutus, Assistant Commissioner of Police, who is performing the functions of Deputy Commissioner Administration. I observed on the wedding invitation that the wedding and reception was scheduled for November the 11th, 2023, at the Pegasus Hotel, Georgetown, Guyana. I instituted a policy of motivating my officers through supporting them. Okimo Brummel wanted for abduction. The police say they are investigating a matter where it was reported by a 31-year-old operations supervisor attached to Aurora Gold Mining Inc. that on October 10, 2024 at about 12.30 HRS, he was held against his will at the Gifflin Mall compound by three identifiable males who took him to his home at Providence, East Bank Demerara and he handed over $9,500,000 to the men. The victim was unharmed and the men made good their escape. Surveillance video of man being abducted in back parking lot of Gifflin Mall by three men who identified themselves as police officers. The man was handcuffed and taken to his hole where he was forced to hand over a sum of cash belonging to his family's business. He said the following day the same three men appeared at his home, but this time in an official blue and white police car, demanding more money. A supervisor at a gold mining company, whose family also operates a sand trucking business, is grateful for life, but is hoping for justice after he was abducted and robbed. The victim, Kevin Fiku, who is originally from Linden but lives in Providence, told investigators that he was taking his vehicle to wash at the Gifflin Mallback parking lot on the 10th of October when three men approached him and identified themselves as police officers attached to the Special Organized Crime Unit. The man said after he initially refused their request to get out of his vehicle after they failed to identify themselves. The men then forced him out of the vehicle and handcuffed him. He said two of the three men were armed with guns and they dumped him into the backseat of their grey Toyota Premio car and sped off from the Gifflin parking lot. Speaking to news source this morning, Fiku said the men drove around town for a while before eventually pulling over at a parking lot and threatening him while demanding money. Fearing for his life, the man said he told the three men that he had money at home from his family business and they then forced him to give directions to the house in Providence. Fiku said he handed over $9.5 million in cash that was at the house for the sand truck business and the men later disconnected his surveillance camera recorded and left with it, promising that they would return the next day. The man said he was left confused and did not immediately report the incident to the police since he was concerned that the men really were from the police force. Fiku explained that he was left even more confused the following morning when the same three men turned up at his house, well-dressed and in a blue and white police car with sirens and police lights. He said the men demanded more money from him and also questioned him about other valuables before leaving the house. He said the following morning he visited the Providence Police Station and filed an official complaint. Police investigators visited his home and while the video recorder from his house was still missing, the investigators were able to get footage from nearby surveillance cameras which confirmed the man's story and also confirmed that the men returned to his house in a police car. The news understands that the police investigations have since confirmed that the car used in the man's abduction is registered to a police lance corporal. The Guyana police force has not issued any information about that Lance Corporal or the other details for the story. However, this morning, the police issued a wanted bulletin for 29-year-old Okimo Arak Brummel, who has been identified as one of the three men who abducted Fiku from the parking lot of the Gifflin Mall. The wanted man's last known address has been given as Bel Air Springs in Georgetown.
war of gargantuan proportions has erupted in the Diana police force between the top East Indian officers and the police force, allegedly including assistant commissioners Ravindradat Badram and Fazil Karimbach, both of whom are perceived to be operatives of the PPP and the African Diana's top brass in the police force, including police commissioner Clinton Hayton and assistant commissioner Calvin Brutus. Criticists have slammed both Hayton and Brutus for being pandering puppets of PPP leaders to the detriment of the rule of law. The East Indian officers are allegedly being backed by several members in the PPP government, including Bharat Jagdeo and his clique. It has been alleged that a group in the PPP allegedly conspired their agents in the police force to bring down Brutus and to push out Hicken. Up until July 12, 2024, Brutus was acting deputy commissioner for administration. In this capacity, he was the second in command of the Diana police force. Brutus was forced out on leave to allow an investigation into allegations that he attempted to launder millions of dollars through the police credit union and that he was ostensibly involved in a $500 million fraud in connection with services provided provided to the police quartermaster store. Police sources say that the Jagdeo clique overplayed its hand as it subsequently became clear that the objective of their conspiracy was to oust Brutus to allow Ravindradat Badram to take up the number two post to become the first in the line of succession to replace Hayton, who is past the age of retirement. Police sources say that the attempt to push out the two top black officers will create irreparable damage to the force that can lead to a breakdown in force control. The plot immediately backfired when police sources leaked information and evidence that Badram was allegedly connected to the criminal underworld. Police investigators accuse him allegedly leaking information to criminals, gang leaders and drug lords, which they say compromised police investigations and placed the lives of police officers in grave danger. Fazil Karimbach has not been speared in the escalating war. He has been dogged by allegations of sexual assault and sexual misconduct. These allegations which were never adjudicated have resurfaced. It has also been alleged that nude photos of him are in circulation by someone they were allegedly sent to. Meanwhile, as the PPP government is scrambling to gather plans to unconstitutionally appoint Hicken as the substantive police commissioner although he seem ineligible as a retiree. Karen Batch has allegedly rushed off a file to the DDP requesting approval to clap Hicken, the commissioner of police candidate, as well as assistant commissioner Calvin Brutus, with dozens of charges arising from an investigation into alleged money laundering, bribery conspiracy and breach of the Integrity Commission Act. Eight Butterfly Sea Moss Powder Take your daily routine to the next level. Natural vegan superfood powder? Essential multivitamin powder made just for you. They indeed got problems with this question about household. We are going to be given, as I suggested on Thursday morning on Cam's TV, $100,000 to Guyanese residents. Guyanese adult Guyanese residents. That is easier. Because first of all, here's the advantages of doing that. One, you got a problem. You don't have to have a problem anymore about defining households. Because a lot of people think a house is a household. Is that true? A house is not a household. And you don't go around and say, well, look, I passed the house and so on. Or I, I finished with that house. You might finish with that house. But you, don't, you have not finished with the household line Kathy uses she presents this veneer of sophistication and and that she did all of this work zero work she still she still has not answered why she refused after the the bill was passed to liberalize telecommunication in and they promised the liberalization of tele telecommunication in their manifesto why she didn't sign the order